Greetings. This is Sunil Iyengar, Director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar as part of the uh, series we do, uh, we've done uh, every few months here from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, this is part of the series of webinars on the Interagency inter Task Force on the Arts and Human Development. Um, today we, we'll have, we have a really great uh, pre series of presentations coming from uh, people working on the arts and early childhood development. Um, let me just go through a few housekeeping notes and then we'll get started. So first, you are all muted and will only be able to hear us. The webinar will consist of two PowerPoint presentations and one short uh, one-minute video. Uh, following our presentations will be a Q&A session. You can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint you see on your screen. We will do our best to address as many as possible during the time we have. Please do not use the raise hand button. Uh, if you have any te technical problems at any time during the webinar, please email neawebinar at arts.gov and we'll attempt to assist you. Also, please note that this webinar will be posted uh, and archived on the po podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section of the NEA website in a few days so you can refer to it in the future. So we'll just get started here. I wanted to just let you know, uh, I'll be telling, just saying a few words about what the task force has been up to lately. Again, this is the Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development, consisting of something like 17 member agencies, departments, and offices across government. Uh, that are that are trying to together promote and investigate opportunities to study uh, the arts along the lifespan. Um, and I'll, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our featured speakers. Uh, Linda Smith, who's a task force member, is the um, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the D U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. She's also the Interdepartmental Liaison for Early Childhood Development. Uh, Linda, along with uh, Chantel Meek from the uh, Administration for Children and Families has been great partners on this whole uh, task force effort. So I really want to thank them again for, uh, for presenting today. Um, also, I'm very pleased to have with us Amanda Bryans, who's the Director of the Education and Comprehensive Services Division within the Office of Head Start. Uh, that's within the Administration for Children and Families at HHS. And finally, uh, we'll be hearing from a researcher, Eleanor Brown, who's the Associate Professor of Psychology at at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A and uh, some concluding remarks. I just wanted to say here that um, if you go and look at what some of the work that we've done lately as a group, uh, this is very timely. Um, as you'll be hearing, you know, we've, we've done a lot recently on the arts and aging, uh, particularly about the arts, uh, cognitive, social, uh, emotional types of benefits in older adults. And so it's, it's really nice to kind of also hear, if you will, from the other side of the spectrum of human development today. Um, so just to recap some of the things we've been up to lately, as I said, uh, earlier this month we had uh, one of our regular meetings with the task force members. We had a great showing and uh, we had a great time explaining uh, where, what we've been doing in, in some of the separate and uh, more collaborative types of projects that pertain to this whole domain. Um, so we reviewed progress on some of the projects I'll mention in a moment. Uh, we also heard from individual agency and department reps uh, about uh, just, just general programming information and act opportunities that we may want to highlight in the future, either through webinars or other types of uh, um, outlets. And finally, um, we were very pleased to welcome three new members to the task force. Uh, one is Commander Moira McGuire, who's uh, the director of the Creative Arts Program at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, the other is Keith Cogdill, who's the director of the NIH Library, uh, that's the National Institutes of Health Library Services Division. And finally, we introduced uh, Tracy Gaudet, uh, the director of the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation within the VA. Um, so uh, I think this, this task force is certainly gaining momentum and membership. Just a couple of quick updates. Um, one is, uh, I referred to this last time we had, these, we had a webinar, uh, but we have available now for free uh, a publication that's essentially a summary of a workshop we held back in, in uh, September. Uh, this was the workshop on the arts and aging that was held by the NEA 
uh, members of the National Institutes of Health and uh, was, was hosted by the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and this report, I think, outlines future directions for research in this area and also highlights some of the more promising studies. Um, I'm very pleased to say that as an outcome of this, uh, there are a couple of things that have emerged. One is uh, my colleagues at the NIH, particularly the National Institute of Aging and I, National Institute on Aging and I, are looking at uh, uh, perhaps presenting later this year at the Gerontological Society of America. We have an abstract in to bring back some of the speakers uh, to present to healthcare practitioners and researchers in gerontology, and we hope that has something of an impact there. But we also are pleased to say that um, my colleagues at NIA and also the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine have been highly interested in pursuing possible funding opportunities down the road for more research, and there's more to come, we hope, on that front. Um, and uh, just also to let you know, we have a new web page. Uh, we finally have a web page dedicated to the task force. Uh, here's the link. Uh, and there you'll find not only our updated membership roster, but archived public webinars. So we've had about four or five of these webinars in the past, as some of you know, covering different agency activities regarding the arts and human development. We also have links to publications and other resources, and we hope to expand those over time. Um, before we go in straight into uh, my colleague Linda Smith at, uh, at, at HHS, I just wanted to point out that um, I, I referred earlier to the fact that we're really pleased as a group to now bear down and look hard at early childhood development in relation to the arts. Um, in fact, there are two uh, pending projects that relate to this. One is uh, with the Administration for Children and Families, as well as the NIH's National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. NEA, NEA researchers are looking at developing a comprehensive literature review and gap analysis that some, would be somewhat akin to the product we produced for the arts and the aging uh, that would tell us what areas remain to be studied and what kinds of uh, effective programming have occurred in the arts in those areas of early childhood. Um, so that's something we're, we're working on in earnest. Also to know that um, this was presented actually at, the, at a recent meeting of the task force, the one I referred to earlier, um, we are teaming up with researchers at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development at NIH to look at including questions about music exposure in early childhood in a large-scale longitudinal study called the National Children's Study that's sponsored by many agencies and departments across the government. So those are two specific initiatives we are working on, on that, in that area, and we look forward to sharing more information as it emerges. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Linda Smith, uh, who will set up the presentation, and uh, we'll get going. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks, Anil. And I want to thank the National Endowment for the Arts for the opportunity to discuss early childhood education, Head Start, and the arts. Um, as we all know, preschool children in the arts is an important topic and one that needs and deserves more attention. Many of you have heard about the President's Early Childhood Initiative, and we're all thrilled with the focus now on, early, on the early years, especially the birth to five years. As we move forward with a focus on school readiness, we can't lose sight of the need to develop the whole child. Children are not one-dimensional, and we need to make sure that all aspects of a child's development are included in our work. The arts can play several roles in the development of healthy, happy children. Arts can be fun and can help children develop self-esteem, self-confidence, creativity, cooperation, and a variety of other life skills. More than that, the arts, whether it's music, painting, dance, or make-believe play, can give children an outlet and a release from stress. And finally, through the same activities, art can help, ther can be therapeutic. It can help adults get a glimpse into the, or a window into the child's needs and, and emotional status. With the work that we're doing with the NE NEA and the Interagency Task Force, we hope to shine a light on the need for research in the arts and the development of preschool age children. We all know that the research into the brain development has been expanding by leaps and bounds, and we need to make sure that that research includes the arts and the development of artistic abilities. Now let me turn it over to Amanda Bryant from the National Office for Head Start, who will describe the work that we're doing with the arts in our, on our Head Start program nationally. Amanda? 
Thank you so much, Linda. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here, and I'm personally excited to have the opportunity to talk a little about the importance of the arts in early childhood education. Um, Head Start was established in 1965, and it promotes school readiness, and it's based on a fundamental belief that children's comprehensive needs have to be met. Uh, so that, that includes things people traditionally think of as cognitive skills like mathematics and early literacy, but it also includes social emotional development, nutrition, health, and uh, family parent engagement services. We have a variety of options for families, including uh, kind of traditional center-based, home-based, uh, family child care homes, and combinations of those. We're in virtually every county in the United States. Nearly a million children are uh, enrolled in Head Start. We have about 20,000 Head Start centers and 50,000 classrooms ranging from the bottom of the uh, Grand Canyon where we serve the Havasupai, remote Alaska Islands reachable only by seaplane or boat to the largest cities in the United States where we have 20,000 children or more enrolled. Head Start since its beginning in 1965 has known that art plays a central part in children's early childhood development and children's development. Um, we require that programs ensure opportunities for creative self-expression through activities including art, music, movement, and lots of dialogue. Our programs uh, must include a balanced daily program of child-initiated and adult-facilitated opportunities. We know that children, regardless of their developmental uh, level, are likely to engage in artistic expression. Uh, it is a, uh, one of the few central forms of human expression, and it is nearly universal even when children have significant developmental delays. We recently revised what used to be called the uh, Head Start um, Child Outcomes Framework and retitled it the Office of Head Start Child Development and Early Learning Framework. Uh, and this is a, a graphic that shows you um, what the whole framework looks like. There are five essential domains of school readiness um, for children ages birth to five. They include cognition and general knowledge, physical development and health, social and emotional development, language and literacy, and very importantly, approaches to learning. And we had to fight a little bit on this one. Approaches to learning can um, include things like helping children understand their own strengths in learning, and it requires that children have the opportunity to engage in creative art expression. Um, and you can see this is, we, we lovingly refer to our framework as a piece of the, uh, as, as a pie, and this is a piece of the pie uh, that has more information about creative arts expression. Actually, if you go to our website, you can click on this piece of the pie, and you'll get information about evidence-based practices that support children's development in music, creative movement, and dance, art, and drama. Importantly, we also see creative expression as central for children's learning across all the developmental the domains, including their physical development, their social emotional development, and very much their cognitive development. Um, Head Start programs are required to measure children's individual progress and overall progress toward school readiness. And they have to use um, evidence-based assessment systems that are linked with their, uh, their curricula so that they can document, um, again, individual children's pro progress, not so much about meeting big benchmark uh, scores, but very much making sure that the program is accountable for understanding each child's developmental level and making sure that, that um, each child is growing and that overall groups of children are benefiting from the um, instructional practices and environment that they are afforded in their program. Um, many Head Start programs, this says choose, but, but programs are required to include creative expression um, in their curriculum, so they must find either find a curriculum that's inclusive of arts components or find supplemental curricula that they can use in conjunction with their main curriculum. So in 2012, around 54% of uh, programs use the creative curriculum, which um, targets the arts as a core area of learning and uses arts in teaching math, literacy, science, and social studies. About 11% of our programs use the high scope curriculum, which um, offers the education through movement program, a series of developmentally appropriate activities, promoting fine and gross motor awareness, music, and movement. Um, throughout uh, the history of Head Start, we've had a series of ongoing arts-based partnerships and initiatives, including a 
fairly extensive partnership with uh, the Wolf Trap Foundation that brought artists to local Head Start classrooms and programs, um, a National Library and Museum Head Start partnership that uh, encouraged programs to work with local libraries and museums around exposing children um, to the arts, uh, a very um, widely used video called uh, For a, a Child, Life is a Creative Adventure, exploring the ways that engaging in the arts um, supports child development. Um, we have a, uh, a program for children's physical uh, activity and development called I Am Moving, I Am Learning that's promoting uh, 60 to at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day in Head Start classrooms. And um, we also have uh, Head Start on Picturing America, which is a recent pro um, program that was made available to all of our grantees um, and delegate agencies throughout the United States. Head Start on Picturing America was a partnership uh, with our colleagues at the en National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, they developed a series of high quality uh, reproductions of American art in laminated posters and we met with them and talked about what we could do and in the end uh, they helped us obtain um, sets of posters for every, every center in our program. And those became the foundation for a book that we published that provided examples of how those posters could be used to develop and expand um, children's experiences around the arts. Um, it's important here to talk about vocabulary. All the children in Head Start are income eligible, virtually all the children. And for Head Start, income eligi eligible means poverty level or below, which for a family of four is about $22,000. Um, vocabulary, a vocabulary gap has been one, identified as one of the chief barriers that children um, in poverty experience when they, they get to school. So we were able to use experiences around these posters um, to contextualize and provide repetition around an incredibly expanded vocabulary, words that normally um, Head Start eligible children wouldn't be exposed to, like sculpture and all kinds of words related to architecture, just the word architecture, but bridge abutment and all kinds of tools and different experiences. And so these became, it wasn't just that teachers were holding up posters, children engaged in ongoing events related to um, events and experiences related to these posters. There were examples, there's a, a beautiful poster of um, some Native American baskets and children were in week-long projects collecting materials and making their own baskets and parents many of whom are, were recent immigrants, talked about the histories of basket weaving in their own communities. So this became a multi-generational, expansive opportunity for children to learn more about the arts and to use the arts to expand school readiness and their, their confidence as they um, moved on. We have an ongoing longitudinal study called the Family and Child Experiences Survey, or FACES, which gives us a lot of information about how Head Start children are doing over time. It includes a number of um, early childhood measures or child assessments across a variety of developmental domains. And at this, at this point, we've um, fielded five FACES cohorts starting in 1997 and going through 2009. From FACES, we know that 100% of classrooms have a dramatic play area. Again, since its inception, Head Start has recognized the centrality of dramatic play and helping children understand the world they live in and develop the social skills, problem solving, planning, sequencing kinds of abilities they need to contribute to their later development. 99% of classrooms um, had a designated art area and we're after that other 1% with the missing art area. We know that teachers um, are encouraged by the people who supervise them, often center directors, usually center directors, to use the arts to teach concepts in mathematics. We recently developed a series of webcasts and a curriculum for colleges to use about early childhood mathematics. And, and throughout that uh, work, the um, place of the arts in teaching math was, again, central. We know that teachers are also encouraged by education coordinators and Head Start programs to use the arts to teach math concepts. We know that children need repetition across different ex time and experiences so that there's an intersection between their developmental readiness and what is in the instructional practices, environment, and experience. So by using the arts, we're more able to meet the individual developmental needs of children. We have 
we're more likely to have the right instruction at the right time for each child. Um, we also know that art is used extensively in the classroom, and we can say that um, nearly all programs, three quarters of programs, use creative movement or creative drama to help understand math um, at least once a week. We also know that programs use music. Um, of course, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, activity you can do with music around rhythm, patterning, sequencing that can support mathematics concepts. Head Start has an incredibly strong commitment to the arts. There is room for growth. Um, we, I think, are somewhat unique in believing that art is a, a basic form of human expression. Uh, we worry that by mid-elementary school, most children think they are not good at art anymore. Often the children who are most able to imitate the teacher, which has a lot to do with fine motor control and not a lot to do with artistic expression, are identified by themselves and their peers as the best artists. Other forms of the arts, such as music and dance, are, uh, are extremely variable in terms of the access and opportunity for children to engage at an early age. So Head Start would like it to do its part to give children a really strong foundation. We view it as an essential part of their school readiness. We're very excited about the literature review that was discussed earlier. And uh, we would like to continue in our role as the nation's laboratory where the very best practices the country uh, knows are used with the children in the highest risk situations and from the, uh, the most impoverished family lives. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I think this is a great example of the kind of uh, pockets of activity going on across the federal government that we hope to bring to light and, and bring to a broader audience, frankly. Um, so it's great to see uh, just how deeply embedded in Head Start the arts appear to be. Um, and, and now we're going to switch over to hear from uh, Dr. Eleanor Brown at Westchester University in Pennsylvania. Um, just a couple of words about Ellen, uh, sorry, about, um, about uh, Eleanor. Uh, one is that back in 2011, uh, when actually prior to the whole concept of this interagency task force, uh, the NEA and the Department of Health and Human Services um, had a meeting at the NEA to discuss future opportunities for collaboration. And we thought it would be useful to bring in some researchers and practitioners to present. And I know that Dr. Brown was one of them. Uh, and, and her work has been you know, published pretty widely in peer-reviewed journals. Um, but there's another kind of nugget about, about her that's, uh, that's yesterday, uh, the NEA just announced uh, a series of grants that we are now awarding as part of the Research Art Works Program. This is the second year of that grants program for, any, for research about the arts value and impact. And very pleased to say that Westchester University, uh, with the principal investigator being Eleanor Brown, uh, has received a grant. And I know she's probably going to be referring to that in her presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to her. I just want to also note uh, briefly, um, again, to the audience members, you can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint you see on your screen. We'll do our best to address as many as possible during the time we have. Thank you. Eleanor? Thank you. I'm so pleased to be presenting alongside my esteemed colleagues from the NEA and HHS, um, Sunil Iyengar, Linda Smith, and Amanda Bryans. It was great to hear from all of you. And I want to thank everyone from the NEA and the Interagency Task Force, and particularly Sunil Iyengar for inviting me to be part of this exciting event. So I am Eleanor Brown from the Department of Psychology at Westchester University, and I'll be talking about my research on the arts of early childhood education. I want to acknowledge all of those who made this research possible, including everyone at the Philadelphia Head Start Preschools, and particularly at Settlement Music School's Kaleidoscope Preschool Arts Enrichment Program. Special thanks to Executive Director Helen Eaton and Director of Early Childhood Programs Terrell Davis. I want to thank the research assistants who have worked with me, and particularly Mallory Garnett and Blanca Velasquez-Martin, the lab coordinators for our Early Childhood Cognition and Emotions Lab. The research I'll be sharing with you was made possible in part by a Westchester University College of Arts and Sciences Support and Development Award. We know that poverty signifies risk for problematic early childhood outcomes, including emotional problems and academic underachievement. The risk has to do with income impoverishment, 
as well as correlated stressors. Children growing up poor are more likely than their middle-income counterparts to face residential moves, relationship transitions, other forms of instability, um, neighborhood violence, and family problems. Such factors, particularly in combination with one another, undermine opportunities for healthy development and school success. The impact of these poverty risks begins early and absent intervention, the effects tend to accumulate over the course of the school years. Head Start is the best national model that we have for equalizing educational opportunities. Head Start provides high quality early learning experiences for children from low income families with impressive results. Yet the challenges posed by poverty and racism mean that children who are economically disadvantaged, and particularly those from racial ethnic minority backgrounds, continue to face opportunity gaps and resultant gaps in pre-academic achievement and social emotional readiness to learn, gaps that can be seen at Head Start entry and exit. Although Head Start cannot be expected to erase entirely the impact of social and economic inequities, it is incumbent upon us as early childhood scholars, practitioners, and policymakers to continue to search for the best ways possible within this and other programs to help children from low income and racial ethnic minority backgrounds make gains in school readiness and demonstrate what they know. The arts hold interest for several reasons. First, because of cultural relevance. The arts occupy a central position in the cultural traditions of most racial ethnic minority groups. Including the arts in education provides opportunities to bring varied cultures into the classroom and allows children to express their individual realities, helping to bridge the gap that often separates home from school for children from low income and racial ethnic minority backgrounds. Second, because of varied channels. We know that human beings learn best when the whole body is engaged and events are registered by several senses. And multiple modes for learning may particularly benefit children who are English language learners as well as those with poverty-related learning delays. Third, music, dance, and visual arts provide appropriate opportunities for emotion expression and may help children to regulate their emotions and behavior in the service of learning. Settlement Music School's Kaleidoscope Preschool Arts Enrichment Program offers a unique model of fully arts-integrated programming. Settlement Music School launched Kaleidoscope Preschool in 1990 to promote school readiness via arts enrichment for young, economically disadvantaged children in the surrounding neighborhood. The founders hoped that early arts experiences might help children to develop artistic abilities and school readiness skills. Settlements Kaleidoscope Preschool is now a Head Start site and is accredited by the National Association for the Education of Young Children. It follows the creative curriculum by Dodge and Kolker, which, as you heard previously, is used by many Head Start programs. The arts programming, however, is completely unique. Kaleidoscope delivers instruction in core early childhood domains through standard early learning or homeroom classes taught by credentialed early childhood educators as well as music, creative movement, or dance, and visual arts classes taught in fully equipped studios by credentialed artist teachers. The program operates from 8.30 a.m. to 2.45 p.m., five days a week, 40 weeks a year, with preschool classes grouped according to age. The program is organized so that the music, dance, and visual arts classes are used not only to develop artistic skills, but also to promote learning in core early childhood domains such as language, literacy, mathematics, science, and social cultural learning. Content and skill development are linked and repeated across early learning and arts classes. For example, if children are learning about autumn, they might sing a song about falling leaves and music. They might pretend to be the wind blowing the leaves off the trees in dance. And they might paint fallen leaves in their visual arts class. Another example is that children might learn about the mathematics concept of shapes by picking instruments of different shapes to play in music, stretching ribbons or bands with their bodies to make different shapes in dance, and cutting or pressing out different shapes of clay in visual arts. To learn about patterns, children might play the drum to the beat in music class, move their bodies to the beat, in dance, and repeat a subject with variation in visual arts. 
the Rangoli patterns that you see here, which are Indian designs placed on the doorstep during Diwali, the Hindi festival of lights, provide an example of how the arts classes also facilitate bringing varied cultural traditions into the classroom. The pedagogy is far more sophisticated than what I can describe or illustrate with simple pictures. I'll share just one further example of how learning is integrated across homeroom and arts classes. Um, in the month of November this year, the early learning theme related to groups and change, and a strategy that teachers employed was experimentation. One week in music, children experimented with sound through echo imitation in the stairwell and exploring the different types of sounds musical instruments make. Then they experimented with grouping voice and instrumental sounds by pitch and other categories. In dance, children experimented with the different ways a particular body part could move, and then categorized the movements along dimensions such as speed and emotion. In visual arts, they experimented with printmaking using natural materials. They took a nature walk to collect materials and grouped them by categories like texture. In all of these classes, children built not only science skills related to experimentation, but also language, literacy, mathematics, and social cultural learning competencies. For example, language and literacy skills by building vocabulary related to sound, movement, and nature. In an initial study in 2010, which was published by Early Childhood Research Quarterly, my colleagues and I examined growth in school readiness skills in Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool Arts Enrichment Program. We conducted two studies. Study one examined growth for just children attending Kaleidoscope. We used Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool curriculum-based checklists to assess growth in school readiness skills. These checklists capture the varied ways that children are expected to practice common school readiness skills through their early learning and arts classes. We found evidence that the program was working as intended. Children were indeed practicing core school readiness skills via music, dance, and visual arts classes, as well as regular early learning or homeroom. We also found no evidence of the achievement gap often found even for children attending other Head Starts. At Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool, children from racial ethnic minority backgrounds performed at the same level as their majority group counterparts at program entry and exit. We also found evidence that the arts integrated program might particularly benefit children with developmental delays. As expected, these children began the school year behind the level of their typically functioning peers, yet they made equivalent growth across the year, and that's a remarkable finding. Um, study two focused on analyses between children at Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool and those at a matched comparison preschool. The comparison site was in a similar neighborhood and served a similar population demographically. Both programs were Head Start sites accredited by the National Association for the Education of Young Children and received the same high quality rating in Pennsylvania. Both programs used the creative curriculum. The comparison site incorporated the arts in limited ways in the classroom, however, was not fully arts integrated like Kaleidoscope. We used the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which is a widely recognized predictor of school success to measure growth in receptive vocabulary across the year. And we found a striking advantage for Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool Arts Enrichment Program. After controlling for demographic variables, children at Kaleidoscope showed three times the growth over the course of the year in receptive vocabulary as their peers attending the typical Head Start. This initial study provided compelling evidence of an advantage in school readiness associated with the arts and led us to embark on another investigation to see whether perhaps the advantage might be particularly relevant for children's social-emotional school readiness. In recent years, a national spotlight has centered on social-emotional readiness to learn as a key predictor of school success. Children need to be able to manage their emotions and interact successfully with their peers in order to focus on learning and succeed academically. Economically disadvantaged children face particular risk in this area because poverty environments pose numerous challenges to emotional well-being. In particular, poverty factors might stimulate an abundance of negative emotions and leave children with insufficient opportunities for learning how to regulate or manage their emotions. We thought the arts might benefit social-emotional readiness first by helping children to experience positive emotions in school. 
Children show a natural interest in the arts. The cultural relevance of the arts also allows varied cultural traditions to be represented in school in a way that fosters a sense of pride and belonging. And the success experiences afforded by the arts promote happiness and pride for children of varied skill levels. Secondly, we thought the arts might benefit children's development of emotion regulation skills because music, dance, and visual arts classes provide opportunities for appropriate expression of negative emotions and promote the acquisition of strategies for successfully managing emotions. I'll show a brief video clip which demonstrates how, through a music activity, children are learning self-control, which is a key component of emotional and behavioral regulation. Wrap your hand around. We're going to uh, preload this video just for a second. Uh, you can stay to yep. stay on. Uh, yep. Thanks, Ellen. couple of seconds. And we're going to uh, just turn off the video, Eleanor. I'm sorry, there's some technical okay. glitch here, but we'll, uh, if you can just go continue, no that'd be great. Yeah, what you can see um, in that video, and I'm sorry it's not playing correctly, but you can see that the children are drumming and with the cues of the music teacher, they are stopping um, when the sound stops. And it shows really a very advanced level of self-control or regulation considering their young age. So it's, it's, I think, a good example of the ways that the arts activities are being used not only to develop artistic skills, but also to promote self-regulation, that kind of control of being able to listen, tune in, figure out when to control your body to stop with a particular external cue, like the music stopping. Um, so, my former grad student and now colleague, Casey Sachs, and I conducted a study just published by Early Childhood Research Quarterly. Part one examined emotions within Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool. We used a well-validated system called AFEX in order to observe children's emotion expression and found that children showed more interest, happiness, and pride during their arts classes as compared with typical early learning or homeroom. We also examined emotions between Settlement's Kaleidoscope Preschool and a matched comparison site. Again, both programs were Head Start sites and accredited by the National Association for the Education of Young Children with the same high quality rating in Pennsylvania. And both used the same base curriculum, the creative curriculum. Yet the comparison site was not fully arts integrated like Kaleidoscope. In addition to continuing to study children's emotion expression, we used a well-validated measure called the Emotion Regulation Checklist by Cicchetti and Shields and got teachers who were blind to study hypotheses to rate children's emotion regulation over the course of the year. Across the year, we found greater growth in positive emotion regulation skills and more of a decrease in negative emotion regulation problems for children at the arts-enriched preschool. I'll highlight just three key findings. Um, first, children at Kaleidoscope showed 60% more positive emotions than their peers at the preschool that was not fully arts integrated. Specifically, they showed more interest, happiness, and pride. Children at Kaleidoscope also improved across the year in their positive emotion regulation skills. These skills include things like responding appropriately if a classmate is sad. Children at the comparison site did not improve. And third, across the year, children at both preschools showed improvement with regard to negative emotion regulation problems, things like outbursts of anger, but the improvement was five times greater at Kaleidoscope. 
The implications of this research are that the arts can be used as an object of learning for young children, but can also be used as a mechanism for acquiring core school readiness skills and advancing social-emotional readiness to learn. Arts-integrated preschool programming, such as that developed by Settlement Music School's Kaleidoscope Preschool, may have a key role to play in addressing current challenges, including those related to poverty and racism. Arts-integrated programming may promote inclusivity, accessibility, and equality for children from diverse backgrounds and with diverse needs. We're now working to further study how arts-integrated programming relates to the development of a wide variety of school readiness skills. And as you've heard, we've also begun an exciting new study of how the arts may influence young children's physiological functioning. About a dozen years ago now, Sonia Lupian and colleagues asked whether poverty could get under the skin. The answer was yes. Poverty influences physiological systems that respond to stress, and that can be measured by the hormone cortisol. The result is a host of negative cognitive, emotional, and physical health outcomes for low-income children. We're now asking whether the arts can get under the skin and alleviate poverty's toll on children's physiological functioning. Our project will examine the impact of music, dance, and visual arts on the stress hormone cortisol. Results will speak to whether child cortisol data can measure arts impact and the potential for arts to equalize educational and health outcomes for low-income children at risk. We applied for the grant through the NEA Artworks Research Program and we're thrilled to have received notice that the project has been recommended for funding. We plan to examine questions such as whether a single arts class can influence cortisol levels as well as whether repeated exposure to the arts over the course of a year of Head Start attendance might change the imprint of poverty on baseline cortisol levels. If we find support for the hypothesis that the arts can get under the skin and influence cortisol, it will demonstrate unquestionably that the arts provide a direct benefit to children's physiological functioning with powerful implications for their cognition, emotions, and physical health. The Cortisol Project is an exciting extension of our research to date because it has the potential to provide data we can point to for indisputable evidence of arts impact. I'm excited about these future directions, and I thank you all for your interest in this work. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, again, our apologies for uh, that the video didn't work, but we'll do our best with the archived presentation. As you know, this presentation will be archived on the arts.gov website. Um, so we'll now take some Q&A. Uh, again, uh, you can submit questions or comments in that box, Q&A box. Don't, please don't use the raise hand button. Uh, instead, just type in your comments and we'll be prompt in responding. So um, one question we had uh, was, when, the when will the literature review uh, that I referred to earlier in arts education, early childhood, uh, be completed or published? Well, we'll work we, we've just gotten this uh, underway in, and we're looking at, I would say, it's reasonable to expect some time next year. Uh, hopefully on the early side of next year, but it's still very much a work in progress and we'll keep you all posted on this. Um, there's a question here, um, and I believe this might be for Amanda. Can you provide more detail about the Head Start resource for college students regarding ways to help young children acquire math concepts? I'm so glad you asked, thank you. Um, we have a uh, website, it doesn't have an easy to remember name, so get ready. It's E C L K. If you just Google ECLKC, you'll find it, or you can go to eclkc.gov. Um, then you can look up, uh, it's pretty easy to navigate once you get on there, and there's a ton of content. Um, but the easiest thing to do is look at the school readiness graphic, which I showed you the um, child development early learning framework. You look under school readiness, and you can click on cognition and general knowledge, and you, you'll get to a tab that will have all of the mathematics material um, that we provide. You can also find a great deal of material on Head Start on Picturing America, including a video called Family Night at the Museum, which talks about how you can engage uh, children with their parents about the, um, the works of art that we provided in a Head Start on, on Picturing America to get in a, uh, supporting expanded dialogue between children and parents. So lots of great resources, eclkc.gov. Thank you. Um, so another question, actually, this is asked by a couple of people in a different way, 
is, and I think this is for you, Elnor, uh, is there a reason why creative drama examples weren't included? That's one question. And the other question similar is, is there a reason that drama is often not specifically included in these studies along with visual arts, music, and dance? Eleanor? That's a very good question. Um, in the particular preschool that I've worked with, Settlement Music School's Kaleidoscope Preschool Arts Enrichment Program, um, the music, dance, and visual arts classes take place in separate, fully equipped studios taught by fully credentialed artist teachers. And that makes them particularly unique, which is why I wanted to highlight them. Um, drama is used in the classroom in a way that's somewhat similar to how it's used in other Head Start programs. So there's a drama imaginary play corner where children are able to act things out and pretend and have, and that's facilitated by the regular early learning teachers. Um, one thing that is particularly cool about the arts integrated program I've worked with is that children might, in their visual arts class, for example, make props, like they might paint a tree that would then be brought into the drama area of their early learning classroom. So there is really nice integration there that I did not show through the pictures that I included in this. Um, drama is absolutely a critical part of children's early development, and it has been shown to be particularly important for building children's executive functioning, some of the skills that underlie their ability to plan, organize, and control their behaviors and learn appropriately in school. Great. Um, Elnor, another question for you. Are there, and maybe for other people, um, are there any studies, uh, sorry, just lost my, are there any studies about the impact of different kinds of arts on young children, e.g. particular musical genres, types of visual dance, visual art, dance, etc.? I mean, I know that uh, Speaking from the NEA, I mean, our, our attempt at a literature review will hopefully gather around, gather some of this information, but I don't know if off the top of your head, Eleanor, uh, have you seen anything that the differential impact, about the differential types of arts uh, impact related to genre? Um, that's a good question. I don't think we have any evidence that would say a one form of art is more important than another at this stage, but um, there certainly have been studies conducted on individual arts modalities. Um, and some of those studies come from a variety of different fields, like there have been studies on art therapy and art being used specifically for therapeutic purposes, similarly with um, music therapy. And I think some people are probably familiar with there's been, there have been a number of studies of the impact of music on children's and and actually older students, adolescents, and adults' um, cognition, things looking at, for example, the Mozart effect. And it doesn't seem like we have evidence that listening to classical music can result in some huge jump in children's overall intelligence. But what we do have evidence of is that um, music listening might prepare specific spatial temporal reasoning skills and make children able to more easily access those skills. Um, so there are individual studies like that, but I think the field really is in its infancy. There's a lot of work that remains to be done, and we're particularly interested in terms of our research to look at how visual arts dance or creative movement and music might differentially or similarly impact children's cortisol levels or stress levels. Great. Um, also, uh, this, this is a question, I guess, uh, just technically, do you, the, the Brown and Sachs paper that you referred to, the two, I think the one that was just published, yes. has it just been published? It, somebody wanted to know where they can get a PDF of that. Um, it's published through Early Childhood Research Quarterly, um, and that is available online. If you search Early Childhood Research Quarterly, you should be able to find that. Great. Um, okay, so I have a question here that I think is directed best to Amanda. Uh, it is great to see the Head Start data about the likelihood of teachers to use the arts in their classroom and that they are regularly encouraged to use the arts in their instruction. 
What type of professional development or resources are available to Head Start teachers to help them effectively incorporate the art? Amanda? Well, that's a terrific question. And let me first say I think that's an area that we can continue, where there's room for a lot of continued development. Um, I will also say that almost all of the content areas or domains in Head Start that we've provided evidence-based practices um, for include um, ways that you can use the arts to extend uh, children's development and knowledge in those areas. Um, on, again, our website, which I understand people are having difficulty finding, and, and which I will give in a, more, a better way, um, you, there's a lot of information of, that can support professional development. I would start with the Head Start on Picturing America resource guide that was developed by the Office of Head Start um, and talks about really multimodal um, ways to support children's development using the arts. Um, but then, as I mentioned earlier, you, we also have a series on mathematics, uh, science, early literacy, and all of them include how the arts can support development in those areas. And the website will work better if you do eclkc.ohs for Office of Head Start .hhs .gov. Great. Thank you, Amanda. That was another question someone had about the website. So that's, that's great. Two birds with one stone. OK. Uh, this is a question from an arts museum, but I think it's actually applicable to other arts organizations that might be tuning in. Uh, this person asks, as an art museum, do you have any suggestions on how we might become involved in providing early childhood education? I know that's a big question, but if you translate it to if you're an arts organization out there and you want to somehow you know, make yourself available as a resource or connect with some of these activities. Or, you know, that's what, at the federal level, we're certainly trying to do that, those kinds of things with this task force. And I wonder if, uh, if anyone has any suggestions, either your, from your point of view as a researcher in the community, Eleanor, or, uh, or maybe Amanda or, or uh, Linda. Anyone want to try to speak to that? Um, one, of, one thing I would, you know, add is that we mentioned it, Amanda mentioned it, and I think the Wolf Trap, which is the national, I think the National Center for the Performing Arts, is a really good resource that I think if you're interested, they do a lot of work with training staff um, and have some excellent programs that I would contact them for more information on how you might want to work with them and use some of what they have. That would be one suggestion I have. Another another thing you could do is contact your local Head Start program. Uh, virtually every community has one. Or you can pick another early childhood provider and um, see if they're interested. Talk to, with them about a project. There are some examples throughout the country of um, amazing work. In Texas, there's a program that developed its own museum working with um, with a local arts museum. They made it. They designed an actual early childhood museum that is open and um, where thousands of children visit. This is Eleanor. I'd say it's an excellent idea and what a wonderful resource. Um, what I do know from my work with Settlement Music School's Kaleidoscope Preschool is that their program provides training to early childhood professionals in other Head Start and related preschool programs in how to incorporate the arts into the classroom and use specific arts activities to foster the development of school readiness skills. And I would imagine that certain museums or other arts organizations in the community might be able to play a similar role, that you have expertise in how to use certain arts modalities to engage children, to foster the development of maybe language literacy skills or any number of core school readiness skills. And that's something that you might share with preschools in your community. Um, I know that surveys have shown that a lot of teachers in Head Start and other preschool programs are eager to incorporate the arts further into their classrooms, but feel at a loss for how to do that in appropriate or sophisticated ways. So certainly reaching out to those programs um, I think would be wonderful. Great. Thank you, Elnor. Uh, just to also weigh in on that last question, um, uh, Linda Smith uh, identified Wolf Trap, for example, based in Vienna, Virginia, as having a program in early learning through the arts. And th there was actually an evaluation of that program and data that uh, are shared in a, in a brief synopsis of that study um, that, that's in a white paper that the NEA and the HHS put out called The Arts and Human Development. 
on the arts.gov webpage. Also, um, there are a couple of other things. Uh, somebody's written in saying that Settlement Music School also offers teacher training through their program, TTIA, Teacher Training Institute for the Arts. Um, and I should just say, as a run-up, in the run-up to this uh, webinar, we've actually got a lot of interest from other people emailing us and telling us about their own activities. Uh, one such program is, I believe, in uh, in Florida, in Miami. Uh, it's the Arts on the Grow program that's part of the Museum for Head Start Children uh, over there. And the the people from that program at the Museum of Florida Art are writing in saying that uh, in 2012 they did a pilot at three Head Start centers and served about 200 students, their families and Head Start's teachers and staff. Uh, and they've now expanded the program to include three additional Head Start centers serving a total of 300 students with about 80% of the children Hispanic and many of their families non-English speakers. And they involve, they include a curriculum, uh, an arts uh, curriculum as part of this Arts and Grow, on the Grow program, which is relatively new. So. Uh, Oh, pardon me, Granny. Okay, uh, there's a question here about uh, is there any information on the preparation of teachers involved in Kaleidoscope in terms of agreed values? Um, I don't know if that that's something that uh, Eleanor, you have an idea about. Information. Question. I. Agreed values. I guess. Let me try to. Uh, blend that with another question, which is, how important is creative self-efficacy to teachers who facilitate these kinds of programs? Um, and you know, I guess both, in, both questioners, in a way, are asking, is there some kind of uh, teacher kind of training or self-efficacy? Well, certainly there's training, but is there a creative self-efficacy this person wants to know that's important to this whole program in terms of understanding the teacher's role? Um, and how, how much of the teacher's role were you looking at? I'm sure those things are really important. Um, so the arts teachers at Settlement Music School's Kaleidoscope Preschool are fully credentialed artist teachers, and that means that they have a lot of expertise in their specific area of the arts in music, dance, creative movement, or visual arts. And that, I think, does give them a great deal of self-efficacy in terms of how to use the arts to foster the development of school readiness skills in ways that are really sophisticated. Um, and that is one of the things that, again, I think many early childhood professionals are eager to incorporate the arts and yet feel, feel like they lack confidence in how to do that in appropriate or effective ways. Um, it is true that Settlement has this program for teacher training that's been really useful in terms of reaching other early childhood professionals and giving them strategies that they can incorporate in their classrooms. Um, and certainly programs like that would probably be useful for boosting the self-efficacy of general early learning professionals. Um, in terms of other shared values, there are certainly, you know, there's the value on creativity, but there are certainly other shared values that I would imagine professionals in other Head Starts share in common, things like a value on equality of opportunity and promoting positive outcomes for all children. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, complicated question, and I appreciate your tackling it. Uh, OK, so we better wrap this up. I wanted to extend, again, a very warm thanks to Linda Smith uh, from the Department of Health and Human Services, um, also Amanda Bryans from the Office of Head Start, and of course, Eleanor Brown from Westchester University. Uh, we had a really a, a fascinating array of questions sent to us, so we couldn't get to them all. I do regret that. However. If you send an email to fedtaskforce at arts.gov, uh, we'd be happy to go through those and maybe even route them to the appropriate uh, presenter and try to get you some answers. Um, so we encourage you to also join our listserv at that, web, at that email address. And uh, stay tuned for future webinar announcements. Thank you all, and have a great day.